My name is Scott Ellis. I'm a product manager here at Google, uh, working on uh, privacy security related technology. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And uh, just to start, um, who here, did anybody here attend today's keynote um, uh, this morning? Um, so, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that, we t that was announced there today. Um, this is a picture I took from the back of the room. Uh, we talked a little bit about sensitive data and different tools that we have to um, handle it, to manage it, um, and process that data. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today. But you know, first, um, you know, what, what I want to cover here is really uh, you know, talking about kind of data and collaboration in the modern era, what we're doing today, some of the trends we're seeing. Um, and specifically talk about some of the tools that we have on our cloud platform in G Suite and on cloud and on our production GCP platform. Uh, and then give a little bit of background on sensitive data, on personal identifiable information. Um, and then you know, the heart of the talk is really to welcome some of our friends here from the University of Chicago to talk a little bit deeper about data science, de identification, and, and, and some of the challenges uh, they face and some of the opportunities that they see. Um, so, just a few trends. When we look at um, data now, what, these are things I picked out um, that I think are really kind of driving a lot of what we're doing. So first, uh, we have a lot more real-time interaction with our users, with customers, and with devices. So this is, again, data coming in, streaming in, um, a lot of back and forth interaction with users. It's very fast, very data-driven. And this is creating a lot of larger, richer data sets. Um, and I use the word richer because we all see these large data sets and we think that we can extract out information from them. Um, value, like just valuable information, um, learn more about how, how our customers or users are interacting, um, predict things that they might do, and in some cases even, even come up with life-saving um, uh, predictions and life-saving uh, uh, things that we can learn from that. Um, and as part of that, as it's real time and we're getting larger and larger data sets, we also want to make faster decisions. So we want to be able to look at this data, and we want to be able to act on it very quickly. We don't want to take months to figure out what we should have done if we need to interact with somebody in seconds or minutes. So we need to be both dealing with larger data sets and making faster decisions. And when you talk about collaboration, that just means we need streamlined collaboration. We need to be able to talk to each other back and forth in real time or near real time. We need to be able to just add somebody in to a, a document or share something with them and have it just be a seamless experience. And again, some of that data that we're talking about is sensitive. So it's not all just you know, bits. Some of this stuff is very sensitive information, specifically sensitive information about people um, that we do need to protect. Um, so securing this data is crucial. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at, you know, across the board of how we secure data, things like two-factor authentication, setting the right access control, audit logging for when people go in and access data, reviewing those audits, so, so generating logs and auditing them. Um, encrypting data, and, and a whole bunch of other things that we do. And in fact, we spend a lot of time, you know, a lot of effort in securing data to mitigate risk. Um, but sometimes at some point, you actually want to do something with your data. You want to open it up. Um, in the last talk, if, if any of you saw that with Joe, they sort of, you want to, you know, there's a key, you might actually open the vault and let people in and do something with your data. That's kind of the idea here. Um, and once you do that, the data itself can be a risk. Um, so. Once you do something, you need to kind of be aware of who you're sharing it with, what you're doing, and in some cases, um, take action to reduce that risk of the actual, in the actual data. So let's go through an example uh, with Sheets. So uh, Google Sheets is a very, um, it's, a, it's a spreadsheet app on G Suite um, that has built in a lot of, it was built from the ground up with a lot of collaboration in mind. So here's just an example. I've got a, a sheet here. You can see a column. We're talking about customer satisfaction. Uh, one of these customers has low satisfaction. Um, and I'm looking here, and I want to know why. So I want to ping in Janet, who is a, a vendor that we work with from another company, and ask them to go in and figure out why is this customer not satisfied? Why is their customer satisfaction low? Maybe they want to contact them, figure this out. So I just simply go in here, I plus them in, put a plus sign, put their name, ask them a question, click go. Very simple, very easy. This solves that streamlined case. It's very easy to get in here and do this. Um, but let's zoom out a little bit. So we have fast, easy collaboration, but let's zoom out. What we didn't notice is that in column F, we had an open note comment field that was stuck in here. And in one of these comments, uh, somebody decided to write some sensitive information. So this was not my intent to share this. I was trying to focus on this other column, in fact, another, uh, another row. But as soon as I share this with Janet, she's going to see the whole spreadsheet. So how would we mitigate something like this in kind of a corporate app? Um, well, I'll go through an example of what we have. So in G Suite, we offer something called data loss prevention. 
where you can set very simple policies around this. And those policies really gear around three main things, triggers, conditions, and actions. So in this case, um, we look at something like a trigger. I'm going to share this data you know, with, with somebody um, outside of my domain. Uh, the condition is I want to look for some sensitive information. In this case, we're going to look for social security numbers, driver's license numbers, and credit card numbers. Um, and then I want to take some action. So in this case, I'd probably want to block sharing, maybe notify an admin, things like that. So if we go back to that, and as soon as I click comment here, what's actually happening in the background is Sheets will look at this and say, I need to go add Janet to this doc. She needs permissions to view it. I need to send her an email to go click and view it. Um, but with DLP, we will first check to see if there's an issue with that kind of action and pr um, provide some sort of warning or block the actual sharing. In this case, document contains a social security um, number, and so we can't share it externally. And that's pretty straightforward. A DLP helps organizations manage their data, and it can help meet legal, regulatory, um, compliance, contractual obligations. And it's a pretty standard operating uh, feature. Um, but what about production and development environments? This was an issue that at Google we face a lot. We have, we use G Suite, um, we love it, um, but we have a huge production environment and it, we seamlessly go back and forth from one to the other in a lot of cases. And so for us, we were very concerned about what, what about when you're developing an app? What about when you're dealing with large scale data that we call kind of like production data? Um, data about our, that's coming out of our systems, about of our, uh, out of our applications, about of our, kind of out of our day-to-day -day business. And so this morning we talked about a new offering that we have called the Data Loss Prevention API. What this really is is we're taking a lot of that functionality that you get to in G Suite, going through uh, a policy and a rules engine, and providing that capability as an API directly into, into, into the cloud platform. And the idea here is that you can now build this um, into your own apps you can take the same kind of logic that we built into Gmail and Drive and Sheets um, and build it into your own applications or workflows. And I'll show a few examples here. Um, so again, it's the same engine uh, you know, that we've, that we've um, built Gmail and Drive on and giving you capabilities like to be able to classify your data, redact sensitive data, um, efficiently manage sensitive data. So again, um, you may just not even know what you have. You have a lot of information coming in, you've got different assets, and you just want to classify them and manage them appropriately. And what, one of the things that we think this really does is unlocks more of the cloud. Um, there's things that you're not doing today um, that you could be doing, but, and, and, and by having a little bit more insight on your data, uh, we think that it can open up more of the cloud. So let's go to an example. So we showed something in the keynote this morning. We showed a live demo app of sort of a customer support chat. So I'm going to kind of walk through that use case here. So imagine you have this uh, customer support app, and in there you have a chat transcript. And you chat, in this case, you've, you've, you've had a customer interaction, and at the very end, maybe you want to email a copy of that to the customer. So you have a simple action in your app. You click email, email copy to customer. But in this case, we've detected that there's sensitive information in there, and you may want to prompt the user, again, in a custom-built app, the same kind of way that we've prompted someone in Sheets. So in this case, we've warned them that there is a credit card number, a social security number, and a phone number. And so maybe you don't want to email this to a customer. That doesn't kind of show a very good best practice. Um, so the op your option could be just don't do it. Or maybe you want to go in and redact that stuff out so the customer still gets the meaning behind the transcript, but you're not revealing their credit card number to their AOL account or wherever it's going. Um, and Another example, but now let's say you, you, know, you have that chat transcript and you've probably got millions of these. And so you take that one chat transcript, you export all of them, and you want to do something with it. You want to maybe load it up, do a bigger analytics, machine learning, um, natural language processing, and you kind of want to analyze what kind of trends do I see in my uh, free text customer support chat. So to do that, first you might want to redact it. So again, similar concept, go in, strip out everything that's in there, and then send it into something like analytics or machine learning. So again, this is just a safer way to kind of unlock more usage in the cloud. Um, and so the idea here, again, is you've got your raw data sitting somewhere in a production environment. Maybe it's just sitting on GCS. Maybe it's loaded up in a BigQuery. Maybe it's just hidden in, in some app that you have access to and you need to extract it out. And you want to get it over here into do you know, higher level analytics, machine learning, maybe just app development. So think about wanting to have test data you want to you want to run through the UI and see what it would look like. Um, uh, you maybe have debug logs that are coming out, and you want to analyze those in a development environment, things like that. Or you want to improve how you share this data. 
Um, so you're already doing kind of secure sharing with data where you lock down the actles and make sure the right people have access. But again, maybe they don't need to see everything. Maybe the people doing analysis only need to see the bulk content but not the sensitive bits. Um, and that's where, again, using an API like ours, you look, at, look for the sensitive data, go in, redact it, and then again, enable those same use cases. Um, so try it out. So um, you can go to this site to find out more about this, this API. Uh, we also have a demo, in, a demo on it that you can go in and start typing on here. Um, and just type stuff in, um, play around with it, see what it detects. As you type, you'll see things kind of filter in at the bottom. In this case, um, I've just given a couple sample things. And you see at the bottom, it starts to come out with, hey, here's what we found. We're kind of confident. We have a certain like likelihood or confidence level here. Um, and you start to get an idea of what you might see in the API as well. Things like offsets, where this data is found, things like that. And I'm going to go through and show you an actual demo here. Um, you just get out of here. And this is just a very, very simple demo. We built a, a, a demo on App Engine um, going in and calling this API. So in this case, what we've done is built a simple feedback uh, web, uh, web page. So here, a customer could go in, uh, type something. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let's see here. And just type in, please date my credit card. And this is a valid card. It's a test, published test card. And it's important that it's valid um, for a couple reasons I'll go over. So I'm going to submit that. Thank you for submitting it. And then we're going to go into an admin view here. And we're just going to see um, an admin view. So this might be something, again, customer went in, submitted something, maybe they shouldn't have put in a feedback form. So your default admin view would be, let's just show the information but redact out the sensitive information here. And so what we've built here is two simple views calling in the API. In this case, we decided to store the actual raw data but not display it to the, to the user by default. So what we see here is just a bunch of asterisks replaced any time we saw a PII. Um, now, if a user, if an admin needs to see that, that can be a, a, a role-based choice. Uh, we have a button here that says Show PII, where you can click it, and you'll start to see the actual underlying PII that's in there. Um, and again, that's just what we decided to do on this app. You might want to generate extra audit logging for somebody who does reveal that, or just restrict it completely uh, to certain people that can handle that level of detail. But just a very simple app to show the point here. And let's see, let's get back. And that's um, just walk through what we did. So again, we took something where you, a very simple um, feedback order form, we sent information in. We showed how you can basically build a view where that information is redacted live, um, shown to the user with, with asterisks in this case, and give them the ability to click and show the actual PII. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of what that looks like using a REST API call. So in the back end, this is, a, this is what a simple call would look like. Um, and it's, it's in a JSON format. So for developers, you'll be able to understand this. But even if you can't, you can almost read this like just human like text, right? I have an item here. It's got a value. And you can see this might be what a, a customer might send in as feedback. My order did not go through. Um, and then uh, we want to look for certain things here. So this is similar to that policy we saw out in Sheets. I want to look for uh, credit cards, social security cards, and email addresses. Click Send. And you'll get a response like this. So in this case, we looked for three things, but we only found one of them. And we give a lot of detail here. So we've said include the quote. Um, show what kind of likelihood we have, and tell me where you found it. Um, in a string of text, it's a simple offset. So that's how simple it is, just even using RESTful API calls, um, just to send data in, send data out. We also have options to do redaction. We also support images. Uh, you can do RESTful calls, um, just basically kind of encoding the, the base64 the image and send it in. It's that simple. Um, and uh, so how, how this might be used, so we've kind of now zoomed out on this app that we built. And we said, OK, so we have an app built on App Engine. Um, there's maybe some, f some you know, front end that we have here. And this is the feedback part of it. So what we showed today was basically taking this API and building it in at the app level, where you can do classification and redaction in line in the app, make it a functional part of your application. But you could also, in the back end, do it under you know, when you're working with your data. In this case, we looked at building it into a cloud data flow pipeline before it gets into BigQuery. We wanted to go in and, and batch in massive like remove the, the PII before we hit uh, BigQuery. But you could also use this as a 
tool to just understand your data and then set IAM roles appropriately. So you maybe just have a dynamic thing that's scanning every week, every month, every day. And as soon as you see something that is classified as, let's say, having certain uh, sensitive data, you lock it down with an IAM role where only certain people that are qualified can see that. So there's a lot of ways that you can weave this in into your workflow. Um, so now I'm going to go a little bit and give a little bit of background um, on sensitive data and PII, and, um, and then we'll, we'll welcome um, our friends up on stage as well. And so what we've covered today is we've talked a lot about finding sensitive data, specifically identifiable data, or what's often called personally identifiable information, PII. You'll sometimes see the word P, uh, SPII for sensitive personally identifiable information. You'll see the word PHI. Um, which for people in the health world know exactly what that means, protected health information. Um, I've been in a lot of rooms where people think it means personal health information or something like that. Um, but really what it is is it's information protected under HIPAA. Um, and it kind of breaks into two parts. And, and the last talk really covered this. But it has to be protected under HIPAA. You have to be coming from a covered entity. But it also means that it's data that is identifiable. And so it does have some overlap with just identifiers and personal identifiable information. So some of these are pretty obvious. If you look at this, names, social security numbers, passport numbers, telephone numbers, uh, various things that you can find um, with our API. And it also talks about some things that are trickier to find. Um, and we're going to go into a little bit of background about what those are and other things that you can do to kind of handle that. But one is highlighted here in blue is a persistent static identifier, something that is not well defined but maybe is um, kind of identifies a small group or, or a single individual. Um, so let's go kind of take a, a look at what classification looks like, or what, what are the things that we do when we're classifying this data? So we'll go with a very simple example. Um, again, this is my credit card followed by a string of digits. So what we look at here is a, a, a bunch of clues. Um, we can look at uh, things like structure. You know, this looks like a credit card. It has dashes between every four, four digits. Um, we also have some algorithms that can go and actually check this number. And it's called a checksum in, in the case of credit cards, where it looks at the number itself and validates that it's real. So if you put just 16-digit numbers with dashes, that doesn't mean it's a credit card. Um, in this case, we can check that it is a real credit card, or at least passes the test for one. We also can look at context clues. In this case, it's pretty clear that this is a credit card. There's context saying it, there's format saying it, and there's some you know, math effectively analyzing this and saying it. And so what do we do uh, with that? So we showed today, uh, way to, one way is to just simply redact it out. Um, other things you can do. Um, is once you know where it is, you can go in and do things like hashing or tokenization. So in this case, we're showing just sort of a random hash. Um, we purposely made one that doesn't look very pretty, um, because, but that's fine. It's a hash. Uh, the idea being that every time I see a certain credit card, maybe I want to generate the same hash. That, that opens up a lot of opportunities for, for kind of trend analysis and analytics. Um, but you can also do things like format preserving encryption and format preserving tokens. So in this case, I've generated something that kind of looks and acts like a credit card. Um, but it, it isn't. It's a token that represents the credit card. This is important if you are really strict on the format that you have. If you're using it in a, in a, in a UI where you want to display something and you want the end user to kind of see it as it would be, whereas displaying the middle one would look kind of off. It might look like a bug to them. So there's a lot of techniques for obfuscating this kind of data. Um, first step is go find it. But there's some challenges there. So we're going to talk about one of the challenges here um, is names. So uh, here's a very simple example. And I'm, I'm looking at a case where the stuff in green, you have the green boxes around the stuff we found, we classified, and we missed something here. So we missed the last name of Zhang. So if we were to use a redaction um, in this, very straightforward, take all the stuff we found and put Xs there, that works, except what we've actually done is very obviously highlighted the thing we missed. So anyone looking at this that sees Xs anytime they see a name knows we found it, knows we redacted it. So when you see a random name in there that a human can pick out, they kind of know you missed it. Probably means it's the real thing. Um, so there's other options here. So uh, NIST uh, talked a little bit about this, and it's a common thing of basically hiding in plain sight. But it, it's the idea of using surrogate replacements or realistic surrogate replacements. So instead of Xs, um, we use other names. So you could go in here, for example, take the same example. And now we're going to replace Janet with Cindy, and we're going to replace Smith with Roberts, and we're going to leave the thing we missed. Because again, we didn't catch it, so we can't change it. And now in that final output, we still missed Zhang, but it's harder to find out. It's harder to see that we missed it. Again, it's not foolproof. There are attacks you can look at this, but it's 
Things like this that you can do to reduce the risk of somebody looking at this and obviously finding the information that you didn't want them to find. So this is an example of hiding in plain sight. Um, and again, pointing it out here, this is kind of like tokenizing, what we showed with the credit card, but what we're really doing is we're using a realistic name as a replacement there. And we've done it in this case with integrity, where Janet is replaced with Cindy in all cases. A very simple example here, but if you did want to know that this is the same name, you can do that. And now we'll just look at one last concept here um, that kind of touches on um, the, that persist stati persistent static identifier, and it's the concept of canonymity. And I'll do a very rough example of this, but imagine you've stripped out all of the sensitive information that you think is in your data set. You've stripped out credit cards, social security cards, um, maybe even names. You've gotten it really down. But what you have is you have a data set with some sensitive information. Let's just say it's salary information or something about, about uh, uh, employees. In this case, let's say it's Googlers. Um, and you wanted to do some analysis on job titles. So what you want to do is keep their job title in, look at maybe salaries and promotions and things that could be sensitive, um, and do some analysis on it. Well, in this case, it seems pretty straightforward. But an obvious problem here is something like CEO of Google. Um, it's not hard for anyone in this room to guess who that is. Today, it would be one person. If you looked over a 10-year period, it's still down to three people, pretty much. Um, so that's an outlier. That's something that we wouldn't have thought of as a unique identifier, but it pretty much is. Um, software engineer, not so much. But you can imagine there's a whole spectrum here. So there's a whole spectrum of sort of what we call these high-risk outliers. Uh, in our case at Google, we have a lot of different engineering titles. There's software engineer, there's senior software engineer, there's distinguished engineer, there's things like Google Fellows. All of these things are different um, um, job titles, and some of them are relatively unique, relatively rare, and would fall into a high-risk outlier group. Um, so those are the kind of things where you can do distribution analysis. And what canonymity does is looks at how many people kind of group into that particular attribute. So in a simple way, software engineer in this small example would have a K of four. There's four people in it just in this sample. And CEO of Google has a K of one. So if you were to think of a threshold that you'd want to set, again, this is a very small data size, but you want your threshold maybe to be two or three in this small example. Um, but in a larger data set, you might be looking at setting a threshold of 10, 20, 100, 1,000, really depending on the use case and, and how sensitive that information is. Um, so this is, again, just one more kind of a little bit more advanced concept, but an important one to consider when you're looking at sensitive data. Um, so what we've covered here, again, is some tools that we have to help you in G Suite, and specifically taking some of those tools and giving the power to you to, to weave them into your own apps, weave them into your own workflows, your own pipelines. Um, you can find out more about this, um, again, online, Google Cloud or cloud.google.com slash TLP. Um, and now, um, what I'd like to do is um, welcome some of our friends up on stage, Michael and Sam, um, from University of Chicago, to talk a little bit more about the challenges. So I've covered some of the basics, but what we really want to hear from is, you know, real data scientists who face this challenge um, and are doing, you know, want to do real things with data and face this issue with sensitive, sensitive information and data identification. And so I'm going to hand it off to them. Great. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Scott. So we're going to try and share a little bit about how we look at this as um, physicians, as folks in the healthcare sector, and as people who use large data sets to try and make discovery. Um, and we're also going to try and share some things where we feel like uh, there may be problems around, uh, around de-identification that we're hopeful will get solved in the next, uh, in the next few years. And so where we're going to start with is, uh, you know, yeah, we're a couple of doctors who are up here, and I suspect several people are wondering what conference we, uh, you, you think we're at. We actually think that cloud storage and de-identification are important. Um, we think they're critical to improving the pace of discovery in healthcare, and we're going to try and convince you of that. Um, we're going to try and convince you that it's important to the kind of research that we do and at the end of the next 15 minutes, uh, we think you'll agree with that. So um, I'm a doc. I'm an ICU doc. I have some uh, grants to study things like this. Um, it is important for me to say that I sit on a couple of committees that provide advice to the federal government. The things I will talk about are, in my opinions, not uh, theirs. Um, but I do want you to know that I'm an ICU doc, I'm a critical care doc, that influences how I think about things. It's a specialty most people have never heard of. We are the specialty that cares for you if your risk of dying is very high 
in the next 24 hours. I'm the chief quality officer of the University of Chicago, which is a moderate-sized health system uh, in the Midwest. Uh, I work with what for healthcare are reasonably sized data sets. And uh, I've experienced both good care and horrible care perpetrated on my family and uh, feel a need to try and make that better. So um, I'm Sam Volchenbaum. I'm at the University of Chicago. And uh, I just wanted to point out a few things about uh, the work that I do. So I have received uh, and I do receive funding from the government to, for some of the work that I do. Uh, and those grants are disclosed here. Uh, I'm also um, uh, a co-founder of a company called Litmus Health, which uh, is building an analytics platform to collect mobile data for clinical trials. So um, that work has given me an interesting perspective into, the, uh, into how commercial entities have to think about privacy of data. And I'll try to bring some of that to the talk today. Uh, I have sat on a few uh, government committees. Uh, the ones that are mostly relevant are things around uh, building data standards for things like mobile, mobile devices and for how we collect data for clinical trials. Um, my day job is that I'm trained as a pediatric oncologist, so I take care of kids with cancer and blood diseases. Uh, I spend most of my time running the Center for Research Informatics at the University of Chicago, which is a 40-person group providing informatics support to the division. Um, my training is uh, mostly in medicine and molecular biology, but I, I took a detour to get a degree in uh, biomedical informatics. Uh, and so that's how my three worlds come together now. And, and what I really try to do is to figure out how we can take data and how we can democratize it so that people can use it to study and improve health outcomes. So we're gonna start with a question, um, and we're gonna come back to this uh, a little bit later in the talk. And the question is just this, what is the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest? It turns out actually most people don't know this. 95% uh, of people who have a heart attack in the United States today survive. And cardiac arrest is the recognition that you are dead and so it is a somewhat more serious condition. Um, and we're gonna come back to the question of wouldn't you like to know it's coming so that you can prevent it? And we're gonna try and show you how we've used data to address that at the University of Chicago. We do wanna point out some things about healthcare that may be different than other areas that use data. The first is what the office looks like. And um, so this is the picture of an ICU that Google Legal would allow me to, uh, to take a look at. But if you look at this here, you know, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 continuous infusion IV pumps. Um, you can see that this child is actually intubated on life support on mechanical ventilation. There are a number of other monitors and things. There's a $10,000 bed. There's two tubes invading the thoracic cavity here to keep the lung open. And oh yeah, there's a patient in the middle of that. What we don't talk about is that each of these devices generate data. Uh, the data are not aggregated in a standard way. They're not stored in a standard way. They're not joined in a standard way. And uh, all of this happens in an environment that is um, chaotic and difficult to influence, even with the world's fanciest algorithms. Our instant messaging queue may also look different than yours. Uh, these devices, which many of you will recognize from history books, are wired directly into our adrenal glands. And they come across with these things like, hi, Dr. Howell, can you come see patient so-and-so suctioning blood from the airway and GI tract, now on as much oxygen as it's possible to give? Thanks, Sarah. Our residents and trainees are very polite at the University of Chicago. Or, hi, Dr. Howell, just took over care for this patient in the ICU, significant respiratory distress, anesthesia coming to start life support, thinks she would benefit from thrombectomy, which means having her chest cut open, her pulmonary artery incised, and a clot taken out. And so those things are disruptive to workflow when you're trying to plan your day, but they also represent a piece of absolutely critical information that is stored and analyzed nowhere. So one of the things that I'm hoping that you'll be convinced of today is that the way we think about privacy in healthcare is, is potentially different than the way people that are not in healthcare think about it. Um, the things that we ask of our patients are, are very, very personal. And, uh, you know, Michael takes care of patients in the ICU. I take care of um, families with children with cancer, many of whom go to the ICU. 
Uh, and the things we ask of our patients are things we do at the, at the worst times in their life. And you can imagine that, that we're asking them to discuss things about death, uh, things about uh, struggles they're having at home. Uh, think about the things that you'll discuss with your doctor without thinking twice. Things about, uh, about pregnancy, about, about psychiatric illness. Uh, it, it's incredible the kinds of things we'll share with our healthcare provider. And we want to do that with the assumption that those data are going to remain private and that if our healthcare data are shared, they're done, so, they're done so in a way that respects that privacy. I'm going to show a couple examples of, of people that had really good intentions about sharing data, but that when, it, when, they, um, when they published their data, they did so in a way that actually exposed patients' medical records and, and, and uh, invaded their privacy. This is a landmark paper from about 15 years ago from Latanya Sweeney that actually focuses on K-anonymity like Scott was referring to. And here are two data sets that they were able to get their hands on. Um, the, the data set on the left, it, uh, it's working. The data set on the left is medical data uh, that was released with good intentions. Whoever released this data set felt that this was gonna be data that, uh, that, that was, was private, that wasn't going to um, give up anybody's privacy. Uh, they had things like their diagnosis, procedures they had, and then three seemingly innocuous items, their zip code, their birthday, and their gender. On the right is a, a voter registration list which they requested, which was publicly available, that had a bunch of things seemingly innocuous, name, address, uh, their party affiliation, but also had zip code, birthday, and sex. And I don't think it's really difficult to see that if you were to combine those two data sets, you could match on those three. And what they were able to do was to identify uh, many of the patients in this set, including the governor of, of Massachusetts at the time, whose data was here. And so this, uh, again, these folks had good intentions that published these data, but when you looked into the sets they published, they were able to expose uh, uh, some of the privacy. This, I think, is a fascinating example. So this was a paper that was published showing an influenza outbreak. This is Boston, and each of the red dots is a site of an influenza outbreak in Boston. And what the authors hoped to do in the study was be able to understand where the sites of influenza were so they could track the outbreak. And so they published this in a paper, and this research group at Harvard took this, um, took this uh, set of data. And when I teach this, I say, how would you solve this problem? And almost always somebody raises their hand and says, I would just put a Google map on top of it. And of course, that's what this research group did. They overlaid a Google map on top, and very quickly they were able to identify 80% of, of the dots on the map to the exact address. And when they relaxed the uh, radius, they were able to identify 100% of the people in this study. So an incredible invasion of privacy, completely unintentioned, seemingly innocuous to put dots on a map. And when I teach about this, we talk about things like, how would you obscure the data? And students will say, well, you would shift everything by 10 feet in some random direction, and that would do it. And yes, that would do it in the middle of Boston, but if you shift everybody 10 feet in South Dakota, you're gonna move somebody from their house to their barn, and then uh, you, will, you, won't pr you won't protect anybody's anonymity. No offense to South Dakota. So, but that's the point here, is that it's hard to do these problems. You have to know the population you're studying. Uh, as has been uh, mentioned in other talks here, uh, there are uh, a lot of um, uh, regulation around sharing data. Uh, the, this is the simplified version of the government's uh, uh, take on how we have to protect data. Uh, and what I want to get across to you is that uh, there's a financial penalty here, which is not cheap. It's $50,000 per violation. So if somebody loses a spreadsheet with a bunch of patients' data, it could run up in the millions very quickly. And we're talking about data over hundreds of thousands of patients. But there's also the, uh, what we used to call the ab above-the-fold risk. Back when people read newspapers, we had this concept that when something was really bad, it would show up on the front page and you would see it on the stack of newspapers. The current version of that is the wall of shame that's maintained by the Health and Human Services, which actually will publish anybody that has a breach of over 500 patients. So you will end up on here if you have a breach. And HHS now is tweeting out whenever they post a new breach, and so you will get tagged in their tweet, uh, and you can now find yourself on the wall of shame if you, uh, if you do this. So the, the risk is actually very high, both from a financial perspective as well as a reputational risk. Um, the HIPAA is the, is the set of rules that governs how we share data. It came out of the, uh, the Re uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act 
Uh, and they've defined 18 identifiers of things you have to remove to make it de-identified. And there's things you would expect, name, address, email address, and so forth. Uh, and But just to make sure that they got everything, they added this one at the end here called any other unique identifying number. So, and I think the last talk mentioned something about this too in the previous session, that it, it, can, be any, it can be any sort of uh, I, something that could be used to identify the person. And so you have to really be careful as you share data that if you just strip out these things that are on this page here, that, that might not be enough. And we'll come back to that toward the end of the talk. So one of the things to think about in healthcare data is that it's distributed everywhere, right? And that's actually the, the dirty secret that people don't talk about. If you think about all the places your healthcare data are, uh, they're everywhere. This was highlighted during the election when there was these calls to release the full medical record for the presidential candidates. Everybody wanted to see the full record and they were probably imagining some stack of papers that was the full record. But as you've seen just in this short talk so far, the full record includes electronic health record data, even data that you're finding on pagers, data that you're finding from pumps, uh, it, it could be scattered everywhere. And the, the interesting quote from this article that the author wrote, he wrote, uh, her medical records are in bits and pieces in doctor's offices, filing cabinets, hospital records departments, and hard to access computers, just like yours probably. And I would challenge anybody to, uh, to come up with all the spots that their medical record exists, all the way down to the, uh, uh, the grammar school office where your vaccination record is probably sitting from, from years ago. So your data are scattered everywhere. So what do we do about this? We want to get the data into a place where we can analyze it and we can do this safely and with uh, good protection of privacy. We need to fill up a warehouse with data. So at the University of Chicago, the way we've approached this is, is to, we, we call it getting our hands dirty with the data. We have a group uh, that I run called the Center for Research Informatics. The guys that work for me, I call them data wranglers because they, because they get in there, they learn about the data, they model the data, they make sure that we're understanding what's coming through uh, as we take data from the hospital systems. And we built what we think is a very well-organized, clean warehouse where when you want to request data on a particular disease, we can get at the data in a way that you, you have assurances about the quality of the data you're getting. And I think one of the, one of the exciting things about, the, about collaborating, working with Scott and working with the Google team is that, is that we have a mutual expectation about the quality of the data and the quality of the analysis that's going to come out of it. So the, the other piece to think about with healthcare is that it may be organized um, differently than you think. And uh, the one study that I'll show you today that uh, someone else did is how much R&D is done in the healthcare delivery system. Uh, when we think about the healthcare system, we think about biotech and pharma and other areas, but in fact, the healthcare delivery system spends less than 1% uh, of revenues on R&D, the food and beverage industry spends five-fold more on R&D than the healthcare delivery system does today. Um, and that is, in some ways, one of the crippling problems of modern American healthcare is that we're not organized in that way. And so one of the things that we've attempted to do, and we'll show you how this plays out in a little bit, is reorganize in a way where the folks doing operations in healthcare and the folks doing research don't live in different places. We call that our Center for Healthcare Delivery Science and Innovation. And it's one of the things that lets us work on really interesting collaborations that impact patients today, not 40 years in the future. Um, I am gonna return and try and give an example of this in action, because why do we care about data? We do care about, you know, data helps us get more efficient, it helps us make margin, it helps us reduce waste, but it also impacts real people in the real world. And we'll give you two examples of how we've done that. So we said, what's the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest? 95% of people with a heart attack survive. Cardiac arrest is the recognition that you are dead. And CPR doesn't work 80% of the time, unlike on TV. And so the University of Chicago has a long history of excellence in cardiac arrest research starting more than a decade ago. And uh, with a team led by Matt Chirpek and Donna Edelson has been doing predictive work in how is it you would figure out who would have a cardiac arrest or develop critical illness before that happens. Um, 
in the end, uh, they did a five hospital study with more than a quarter million patients. And you know, I'm a predictive modeler at heart. Uh, this thing warms, uh, it warms my heart. It's a 27 dimensional model. It's got spline terms, the whole nine yards. And if you like areas under the curve as a way of, de of assessing how useful a model is, uh, this is today the best predictive model for cardiac arrest on the planet um, developed in our patients. But at the end of this, you know, what do these researchers have? They have a, a, a paper published in a journal affecting no patient anywhere. And so we've been able to take this, uh, we have an enterprise services bus architecture at the University of Chicago, turn this live uh, and see over and above our usual methods for responding, we've seen a 20% reduction in cardiac arrest in about a year and a half span after implementation of this. Um, that's a pretty clever thing uh, that we've been able to do, but it, it, and it's gotten some uh, news about how we've taken uh, things from the data warehouse, from the Center for Research Informatics, turned it into something in the real world. But there's another interesting question that now we can attack, and it's actually the question of, uh, can critical illness be contagious? So imagine that you're hospitalized, and it's a 10-bed unit, and you're in the third bed, or your mom's in the third bed, or your brother, or your daughter. And what happens if the person in bed sick gets sick and needs the ICU or has a cardiac arrest? What happens to you is the risk contagious. And so if you thought for a minute about how you would study that, it's actually a really difficult problem to sort out. And so we took about 90,000 patients' data, time ordered them, broke them down into time blocks, ran the 27-dimensional multivariable model, sorted out a zillion other factors, and we were able to answer the question uh, of this, that in fact, yeah, um, if that person has uh, crumps and goes to the ICU, for the next six hours, your risk of developing critical illness goes up by 18% after extremely careful control for how sick you are. And if two people have that happen, then the risk goes up by 54%. Um, and so now we're attempting to turn that live into how do we actually deal with and adjust with, uh, with that. But these are examples of the reasons that we care so much about the quality of data, how we get, them, how we get the data sorted, and then how we begin to be able to use it. Um, but privacy protection is critical to making discoveries like this. We can't do it without it. And it's really hard to do privacy well while making discoveries that still save lives if you're moving outside your own institution. And so we said healthcare data may be a little bit different. Privacy in healthcare may be a little bit different. Healthcare may not have R&D as you would recognize it. And that privacy protection is critical to discovery. Um, and so we are really excited about the changes that have been happening over the past few years. We're, we're really good on our own at using discrete data for predicting things. We've been doing that for a while. It's not easy, but we've been sorting out how to do it. But today, we're beginning to be able to think about how we use the whole electronic health record, including the notes that doctors and nurses and others write, um, and one of the problems is if you're trained like I am as an epidemiologist, as a healthcare researcher, once you get to 400, 500, 600 variables, my models don't work. But if we start using free text notes, there are really new challenges uh, that are hard. Okay, so hang in there now. I'm going to take you through a couple examples of, of some of the challenges of using free text notes, and I think they're going to highlight what we're so excited about when it comes to collaborating with Google on trying to think about how to do de-identification of free text notes and how to do this analysis over large sets of patient data. This is an example of, uh, of, a, of a couple notes on a patient. Uh, the note says, uh, Mr. Smith is a 65-year-old man with weight loss admitted on August 1st. Mr. Smith lives with his sister, Jane, and there's a family history that Jane had tuberculosis diagnosed in February. So, you know, if you're seeing this guy, he's got this weird unexplained weight loss and he's living with somebody with tuberculosis, you immediately start thinking, could there be a connection? Well, if we try to de-identify this information using standard redaction, we'll take out the names and the exact dates, and we're basically left with blank is a 65-year-old man with weight loss, admitted sometime last year, blank lives with his sister blank, and blank had tuberculosis diagnosed sometime. Useless, right? Like, that doesn't tell us anything. Well, we can do a little bit smarter than that, and we can actually instead um, 
take the note and we can take out the name, but we can preserve the admit date. So we can say that uh, so-and-so is a 65-year-old man admitted with weight loss on some date. And now we can use the colors to say, well, so-and-so lives with his sister, another person, and that, that other person had tuberculosis, and there's a relationship there. So this removes the HIP identifiers, and it satisfies the de-identification. But still, the computer's not telling us, which is painfully obvious to everybody who's looking at this, is, uh, yeah, uh, something's could, something else could be going on, but I really think that you should think about he might have got TB from his sister. So this is an example of a relatively simple heuristic for a human to come up with, but a difficult text problem for a computer to solve if you want to maintain privacy. So why is de-identification in healthcare a hard problem? Well, it's hard for several reasons. One is that we, we're, we're trained to think that we need to connect the data with the outcomes. And for discrete data, that can be relatively easy. But with free text, it can be much more difficult to know what the data are, the discrete data that's in the text, and what the outcomes are. Uh, we must remove the HIPAA identifiers, including the dates. Uh, and in practice, when we do this with discrete data, like blood pressure and heart rate, it's easy to remove any of the HIPAA identifiers. But as we move into free text, it becomes very difficult, and you need a high-performance environment to do this. Uh, when we were uh, first thinking about doing uh, this collaboration, we thought, how long would it take us to de-identify our 20 million text notes? And the first feedback I got from my team, that even on our high-performance environment, it would take us six months to do it. So I have a relatively complex example to take us on out, but I think it's important, and, and try to hang in, here, in there with me, because I think this is very um, illustrative of the, of the opportunity here. So here's Frank Jones, he's an 85-year-old man here for his annual checkup. He's been doing well, but recently was forced to move from his home in Batavia, Illinois, to Elgin due to insufficient funds. His eldest son, Craig, was recently killed in an automobile accident. Mr. Jones' remaining seven children all live in Illinois. Mr. Jones' orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Reeves, has been concerned about his leg following his amputation last year for diabetes, but overall he reports new no, no new medical issues. Okay, so there's a lot of identifiers there. So let's just redact out the identifiers, that his name, and you're left with this note that uh, takes out all the names. And uh, there aren't any dates in here, right? And there aren't any addresses, and there's no uh, full zip code. So this note, by all accounts and uh, purposes, would look to be de-identified, right? But if you think back to the K-anonymity uh, lecture we had before from Scott, uh, there's something wrong with this note, because I would argue that it's not been de-identified appropriately. So what identifiers remain in this note? Well, I would argue that being an 85-year-old man in a small town in Illinois is not a very uh, anonymous thing. Uh, the fact that his son was killed in a car accident the fact that he was had, has an, uh, has, is an amputee, the fact that he has uh, eight children, now seven children, I would say that all of those things reduce this person's uh, K-anonymity number very low, so that this note is actually quite identifiable. So if, if we're left with looking at all these identifiers, why don't we just take them out? All right, so here's the note now. I would argue now that this note is pretty much useless. We've taken out all the meaning, and we're left with a bunch of X's in here, and there's no meaning in the note. I think this is the part where it gets really cool. So wouldn't it be cool, really, if we use the power of all the information that a company like Google has at its fingertips to, in real time, think about what is the age distribution in small town Illinois? Is it safe to have an 85-year-old called out here? Do we have to change that? Uh, what about uh, the fact that he was, uh, had a son killed in an accident or that he's an amputee? Uh, Google can check to see, was that in a public record somewhere? Was there a newspaper article about it? Uh, was it uh, is there a publicly available obituary that says this? Uh, what about the fact that he has a huge family? Uh, is that a common thing in central Illinois? Do we, need to, do we need to change that as well? And in real time, you could take this note, actually, and turn it into something that uh, does some of this uh, obscuring by changing the names. Maybe you could change the age a little bit. But if you change the age, you want to do it in a way that maintains the information in the note. Uh, there's an, an amazing array of different things that we could consider if you think about the power of all the other reference data that lives underneath the hood. So de-identification is a huge problem for research. Um, because we need so much data to study rare, pheno rare phenomena, like the kind that Michael talked about, looking for patients going to the ICU, you need, we needed you know, 90,000 patients to pick up even the smallest amount of signal. So ideally, you would do this for many hospitals, and you would re this would require you to collaborate and to share data. And to do that, you're going to have to standardize the data while de-identifying it and satisfying all the different privacy boards that you're not going to do anything that compromises the patient's privacy. 
So that's why we're here today, and that's why we're so excited. Uh, we're really looking forward to this collaboration because we're going to understand how to use and study sensitive data at large scale. Uh, there's a lot we have to do, and there's a lot we're going to have to do to get this done. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how this de-identification process makes research more difficult. What is the, what is the spectrum of as you de-identify things, does it make research harder to do? Uh, when is HIPAA not enough? I showed you that note before, and I argued that we removed all the HIPAA identifiers, but you would say HIPAA is not enough there. We need to consider the other ways you can identify people. So can these new approaches maintain privacy while preserving the research value of the information? Uh, and finally, what tools can privacy boards use to, to protect patients? Right now, whenever our, our IRB has a tough question, they turn to Michael and me and say, is this, is this good enough? And, and I would think there's a better set of tools that privacy boards can start to use to standardize how we think about privacy uh, protection for patients. So we really think that better de-identification and better analytics tools is going to speed up healthcare discoveries uh, and is really going to help improve um, uh, patient outcomes uh, by letting us study these enormous large sets of data. So that's why we're very excited. Here's some of the groups that have helped uh, make this possible at the University of Chicago. And if we have time, hopefully, for Scott, Michael, and myself, we can answer some questions. Thank you.